Well, how about this then? We are here on Trans Am Alley and it's a part of the Rolex Monterey Motorsport reunion that I absolutely love. Cars from 1966 through to 1972 and two men that know all about and one man that needs no introduction, Mike Joy and Ken Adam as well alongside me. Uh, Mike, just talk to us about the era and talk to us about some of these cars. It's always, always one of my favorite exhibits at a show like this. Well, and Monterey and the people who come here absolutely love these cars because every group that runs in historic Trans Am, which is Group 8 here at this event, is the car that actually raced in period. Now, yes, they've been restored and repaired, but they're not allowed to build the spec above how these cars were then. You had a 302 cubic inch engine. That's what you have now. Uh, the rear end ratios that were available then, the brakes that were available then, the intake manifold, everything has to be the way these cars raced. And the group, the groups, sorry, hey, we're at a racetrack. The group is self-policing. And uh, Ken is our steward and also one of the upfront runners. So it, it just makes it really collaborative fun. Uh, we go out there, and I don't think there are more than a driver or two here that are concerned about winning. We're more concerned about entertaining the fans, putting on a good show, uh, getting out on the track, and then passing, repassing, and just show the thunder and the fury that, that this series was back in the day. Yeah, and that's exactly what it was. Thank you, Mike. So the thunder and the fury. It does, you know, shake your rib cage when oh, these things go by, Ken. But I mean, this was all about, like you said, each manufacturer had a car, and they were like, win on Sunday, sell it on a Monday, and that's what this was all about, wasn't it? Exactly, and that's the fun part of the group. As you look around here, you'll see the famous cars for sure. But notice the independent cars. Those are the guys that wanted to have fun and try to beat the factory. And uh, those guys, they still have a lot of fan base. My car was from Connecticut. When we go to Lime Rock. People still come over from the 70s who remember the car or worked on the car or helped on the car. So that the history is a, a whole big part of this group. So as this class developed from 66 through 1972, uh, John Bishop at the Sports Car Club of America wanted a professional series for these cars, not for sports cars, but for what they called sedans. You know, we now know them as pony cars. The, so the rules were very restrictive. If you swing around and look at Tom McIntyre's Camaro here, you'll see it still has a full interior, uh, except for the carpet and the headliner. Those inner panels and the door cards, those were all required. And this was as good as race cars got uh, back in 1967-68. In side glass the windows still have to roll up and down now this is how the series was in 68 ken's mustang is a 69 and he can show you what changed just from one year to the next ken let's go and have a look at this one because like you're saying great story with this one as well but the changes year on year we see it one of the kind of small subtleties that's really cool on this car is the pipes see how they're built into the the frame they kind of outlawed that later but it's a cool feature of the car it's one of the features that kind of proves that this was the car this car doesn't have the door glass because it ran later. Regardless, you had to meet weight requirements, so everything was kind of tried to be equal at the time. One cool feature on this car is these are holes for lights when it ran at Sebring and Daytona. So before radios, you would have either a green or a white or red light, and that would mean something to the pit crew. So that's kind of cool. The, uh, the fun thing, the guy that run this car, the 45 came from their hopes of, of sustaining sponsorship from Colt 45. <laughs> so that was a cool story that they told me after the fact. And did they ever get that, you think? They, they didn't, but actually I have a picture of the car. At one race, they actually did the font yeah. like on the bottle of Colt 45. Uh, Colt 45, not the firearms, no. uh, but the malt liquor that was exactly. popular back in uh, the 60s and early 70s. I love this era and I love this alley, as I was saying to you. When you look along here, Mike, just the colors and the styles. I mean, I, I was a kid growing up in the UK in the 80s, but what I was watching on the TV shows back then, you know, these are the cars that, you know, I would have been seeing in American television and they're, right. they're just, you, I was drooling over these cars. <laughs> well, I was too, you know, in 1970, I was sitting on the hillside at Lime Rock watching these cars, and I was in the dunes at Bridgehampton and standing amongst the rocks at Briar in New Hampshire and, and at Watkins Glen and got to see all these cars run in period, uh, got to cover the events, talk to some of the drivers. And so this has always been where my heart is in racing, even though uh, my job is in NASCAR, and I love NASCAR, but yeah, this, this, is, this is where my heart is. And to be able to be a steward of some of this history and drive cars that were actually part of that series back in the day 
It just yeah. just a, an incredible dream come true. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, Ken, something I just thought of that you said before, what's interesting is these cars are still being driven and still being raced. In the case of the Javelin that's on the way over there, like you said, talk about the numbers on how many times that raced then and how many times it might have raced since. Yeah, back there when the factory had these cars, they would race maybe seven, eight times, and they'd be have new technology in the next season and move on. That car's been raced several hundred times, and it's still hanging together. They're still winning. <laughs> and still winning. And, still that, winning. and this is the great thing as well, Mike. Some of these cars are one-offs, and, you know, guys like Ken look after them, preserve them amazingly well. But you guys do take them out, and, you know, you're, you're giving them a, you know, you're, you're driving them anger. You're giving them a bit of a go. Absolutely. I mean, you know, these cars go through a set of brake pads every couple of weekends. They'll go through more than one set of tires during the weekend. An engine gets about 50 hours before it has to be refreshed, much more like a contemporary race car. But I think the worst thing that could possibly happen to these cars is that they sit in a museum and gather dust. Our whole thing is about getting these cars out there. Uh, the sound and the fury, that's, you know, we're, we're the 1 p.m. race. On, on Saturday, right after lunch hour, before at, right after the national anthem, and you know, everybody flocks to the fence or into the grandstand because everybody has a memory about at least one of the cars that are here. And, it, and, it, and as time moves on, it gets even more important, Ken, that guys like yourself and all the owners here do preserve them and do look after them because we're not going to see cars like this ever again. This technology, the internal combustion engine, we all love it, but it's it's on its way. And we love sharing the stories. And you see after our race, kids will come over that want to learn about the car. We let them sit in the car, climb on it. We'll let them start it. They go crazy. That's fun for us as well.